Hi guys, this is Jen. In this video, we are reading Macbeth from the angle of Freudian psychoanalysis. Now, before we dive into all the good stuff, just a heads up that this isn't the video for the faint-hearted, because I'll be discussing some technical concepts and referencing quite a lot of examples and quotations. It's definitely a hardcore gung-ho one. But if you're looking for a refreshing perspective on the play so that you can write a kick-ass analysis, then this is definitely the video for you, and you're going to want to watch till the very end. So buckle up and let's go. Psychoanalytic theory is a beast. No, seriously. As an interdisciplinary field crossing psychology, pathology, history and culture, psychoanalytic literary theory is an entire animal on its own. But in a nutshell, it is concerned with looking at patterns of unconscious desires in a text. In Freudian psychoanalysis, the unconscious is the part of our mind where all repressed thoughts are stored. And these thoughts are repressed because they are, according to Freud, perverse by standards of civilization, such as incestuous desires. But while we stash them away in our mental recesses, they never really go away. Instead, they seek expression through various forms in everyday life, like dreams, sexual innuendos, or slips of the tongue, which is also where the term Freudian slip comes from. A classic Shakespearean text for psychoanalytic studies is Hamlet, especially on the Oedipus complex, which is the theory that sons are, on a subconscious level, sexually attracted to their mothers, and in turn, they wish to supplant the father. This pattern of desire is evident in the prince's conflicted emotions towards his mother, Queen Gertrude, and of course, in his marked hatred for his stepfather, King Claudius. But actually, Macbeth could also be viewed as the tragedy of a man with an intensely repressed unconscious, which I'll go on to illustrate through three key ideas in the rest of this video. tenets in Freudian psychoanalysis is that dreams are a reflection of our unconscious desires. According to Freud, whatever thoughts we've repressed during the day will eventually seek an outlet elsewhere, one such outlet being our dreams at night, when our truest, most private selves come peeping out from under the sheets. For ordinary people, dreams may be a cause of mild embarrassment or even intense shame, as we are forcibly reminded of our crush on a friend's partner or our wish to throttle a cruel boss. But most people would never really act on these unconscious cues in real life. In Macbeth, however, the protagonist does act on his unconscious, and there's an argument to be made that his actions aren't so much driven by his own volition as they are by his inability to control his unconscious thoughts. Now, early on in the play, Banquo introduces the notion of dreams as an omen. When he tells Macbeth after the encounter with the three witches on the heath, I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. Now the key word here is some. Why some truth as opposed to just truth? Now if we recall, the witches foretell in Act 1, Scene 3 that Macbeth will eventually become king, as will Banquo's son. But what they don't reveal is how these prophecies will materialise, or how long Macbeth's kingship would last. This raises a curious question. Has Banquo in fact dreamt the other, more sinister part of the truth, but is here not relaying it to Macbeth? Considering the fact that the play doesn't ever really provide a reason for Banquo's later suspicions of Macbeth's culpability, then this dream he alludes to can actually be viewed as an early warning he has received about what Macbeth would eventually do. Conscious first manifests through his hallucination of the dagger, and we can actually understand hallucinations as a kind of dream. And so this hallucination happens right before he does the deed of murdering Duncan in his bedchamber. Why does Shakespeare have Macbeth imagine the weapon before carrying out the deadly act? One possible reason is that he's trying to show Macbeth 
to be a victim of his unconscious, by extension, suggesting that our free will is often constrained by a more powerful force, which is our unregistered desires. Note that in Macbeth's dagger hallucination soliloquy, he begins with a string of questions about the genesis of this dagger vision, as he says, Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? Now there's a touch of the Freudian in the coinage of heat-oppressed, where we understand heat to connote desire and oppressed to indicate repression. The implication is that while Macbeth wishes to murder Duncan so that he can usurp the Scottish throne, he has been suppressing this wish and he is not sure how much longer he can keep his unconscious kettle from boiling over. The imagery of the mind and brain underscores that the cognitive function is the dominant faculty directing his actions here. But it turns out that this organ, which supposedly enables rational thought, is also one that houses irrational desires. The notion that Macbeth is spurred on by his unconscious is also reinforced by his reference to wicked dreams later in the same speech, after he acknowledges that the dagger is in fact a hallucinatory product of his inner desires, as when he says, Now over the one half world nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. And so we see that slumber, as peaceful as the act may seem, is portrayed instead to be a dangerous thing. And the one half world that is asleep seems dead, and the association of sleep and death characterizes slumber as a morbid act. And dreams are personified as a wicked agent who abuses the metaphorized curtained sleep. But of course it isn't the dreams themselves that are wicked, but the ingredients of those dreams, which in the Freudian view stems from our unconscious. In Macbeth's case, because his unconscious contains transgressive desires like killing the king and usurping the throne, his dreams become a nightly haunt from which he can't escape, as they steadily push him towards the wish fulfillment of realising his faulting ambition. patterns in the play is its fascination with the maternal instinct. For a character who is so obsessed with power, Macbeth is in fact rather powerless in the face of the women around him. A possible interpretation for this is that he views them as surrogate mothers who yield a natural authority over him. And there's a clear pattern of female control throughout the play, beginning with the witch's damning prophecy in Act 1, which is then activated by Lady Macbeth's prodding of her husband in Act 2 and beyond. Later, when Macbeth loses his sanity at the sight of Banquo's ghost, he seeks help and counsel from none other than his wife and the witches. So there's a sense that the women in his life function as his surrogate mothers, to whom he turns for guidance at points of desperation even though we see that these mothers actually act against type, because they're not protective and nurturing, but instead dismissive and even destructive. Most tellingly, Macbeth is ultimately undone by a single-minded misunderstanding about the most biological aspect of motherhood. He doesn't realise that mothers can in fact give birth in more ways than one, and is therefore defeated by Macduff, who was untimely ripped from his mother's womb rather than being of women born in the natural way. In the Macbeth's exchange about the witch's prophecy, the conversation resembles more of a mother and son dialogue rather than a husband and wife one. Upon Macbeth's arrival at their castle with news of the king's visit that night, Lady Macbeth is the one who directs the course of their conversation, specifically with her sharp, insistent questions. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. And shortly after, when Duncan has dined at the Macbeth's castle, he has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Have he asked for me? No, you know he has. The interrogative tone of Lady Macbeth's questions cast her in a matriarchal stance as she asserts the sort of steely forcefulness that often seems like a mother's prerogative. Interestingly, Macbeth is also comfortable with this sort of dynamic, 
and it's almost as if he needs his wife's verbal cues to know what his next steps are. So while his wife emasculates him by probing at his manhood and berating him for dilly-dallying, Macbeth absorbs it all as a respectful son would the harsh but honest words of a mother. He simply doesn't fight back. And when Lady Macbeth cries for the spirits to come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gore, we see that her self-perception is fundamentally maternal. Even with the replacement of milk for bitterness, her role remains a giver of guidance and momentum. But in her case, it is of course directed not towards a son, but instead to her husband. Likewise, Macbeth's behaviour in front of the witches reminds us of a guileless, impatient child who struggles with ambiguities. To him, their words aren't just supernatural prophecies, they are psychological sustenance that keeps him going with a definite sense of purpose. Instead of waiting for the prophecy to take its course and manifest in time, Macbeth rushes to fulfil the witch's words as a filial son does to live up to a mother's expectations. Note that in Macbeth's communication with the witches, he's always begging them to give him answers, like a child thirsting for knowledge from a worldly wise adult. Now notice from the slide just now, the imperatives speak, stay, tell me more, answer me. These words betray the childlike essence of Macbeth, which also makes his pursuit of authority rather ironic. What's interesting is that there's also a hint of the maternal in the witch's demeanour, as they relay half-truths to Macbeth in the same way that mothers don't always tell their children the entire truth about things, except of course mothers do it to protect, whereas the witches do it to mislead. This recalls our earlier point about Banquo's statement on to you they have showed some truth as well as the apparition's cloaked truths about no man of woman born being able to harm Macbeth, which is of course phrased in a way that makes Macbeth ignore the possibility of Macduff being a product of Caesarean birth, and about Macbeth never being vanquished until Burnham Wood to High Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. But we know that Malcolm and Macduff's retinue will eventually uproot the trees of Burnham Wood in their march towards Dunsinane. So the witch's withholding of truths is a perversion of the maternal instinct, because while mothers tell their sons half-truths out of a protective desire to shield their child from harm, the witches push Macbeth towards his death with every new revelation they give, paltering with him in a double sense, to use Macbeth's words in Act 5, Scene 8. So from this angle, Shakespeare problematizes the sort of mother-son dynamic that's misplaced from the biological to the relational realm. If a man gives into the temptations of seeing women as substitute mothers or sources of maternal instruction, he gives up his critical thinking and judgment, and in Macbeth's case, makes the wrong decisions and ends up sabotaging himself. Say the uncanny, Freud posits that humans have a tendency to behave in self-destructive ways. Well, this seems to contradict the pleasure principle, which states that all actions are carried out for pleasure. It does manifest in many acts of self-harm we see in the world today, suicide being the most extreme example. Freud calls this the death drive, and it's a drive because we are urged to repeat such patterns of self-destruction despite knowing that they are bad for us in the conventional sense. Macbeth, in fact, is a good example of this death drive, as he largely initiates most of the circumstances which eventually lead to his defeat and demise. For instance, he knows that the witches are dubious creatures that he should not trust. After all, he himself calls them secret black and midnight hags, but he actively seeks them out in Act 4, Scene 1 for clarification and validation of the prophecy, thereby repeating the self-destructive occasion for him to fall even deeper into his murderous, 
power grabbing rampage. This compulsion is reflected in the repetitive speech patterns of Macbeth's exchange with the witches, both in Macbeth's insistent imperatives of answer me and tell me and in the witches' strings of tricolonic echoes as they trot out Macbeth, 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 show, show, show. So we see here that repetition serves as a trope for danger, as every replicated cry edges our protagonist towards the precipice of sanity. Another strain of compulsive behaviour that manifests Macbeth's death drive is his need to kill. Having murdered Duncan, he technically assumes the throne and achieves his goal. But the haunting spectre of the witch's prophecy about Banquo's issue and the apparition's warning about Macduff trigger Macbeth's desire for other murders, specifically those of Banquo and Macduff's entire families. The irony, of course, is that by initiating the killing of others, Macbeth is driven towards his own death with every new death he's responsible for, as the dramatic arc below shows. So it's perhaps worth noting then that Macbeth nears the end of his life with the famed tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow lament, which symbolically aligns the motif of repetitiveness and compulsion with the notion of life's death-driving monotony and meaninglessness. So it appears that these instances of death aren't just indications of Macbeth's violence, but more importantly, they are mirrors of the tragic hero's self-destructive nature, which of course compounds the tragedy of it all. Whew! If you've stuck around for all that, well done and thank you. But in any case, I hope you found it useful and refreshing as an alternative approach to reading Macbeth. Let me know if you'd like to see more of these theory-based analysis videos and be sure to check out my blog posts on the play, which I'll link to in the description box below. Otherwise, please do hit the thumbs up button below and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more useful English Lit Study resources down the line. I'd massively appreciate it and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!